In recent years, commercial human spaceflight has taken off, with many companies finding ways to make the business commercially viable. This new industry is rapidly advancing, but the history of it is still important to understand. This video will summarize the rise of commercial human spaceflight. There have been commercial interests in spaceflight since the dawn of the space age. AT&T's Telstar-1 communications satellite, launched in 1962, was the first piece of commercial space hardware. This historic flight came only five years after the Soviet Union put the first artificial satellite into orbit, and the industry has only grown since then. Satellites for Earth observation, GPS, communication, and many other things construct the majority of the space economy even today. Throughout the majority of this history, governments have paid for, developed, and been in charge of human spaceflight. Scientific pursuits and national pride were the only reasons to send people to space. The earliest private citizen to fly to space was in 1986, with the last launch of the Space Shuttle Challenger. Christian McAuliffe was a school teacher from New Hampshire. Tragically, she and six other astronauts perished 73 seconds after liftoff when one of the shuttle's external boosters exploded. This put an end to NASA's plans of flying private citizens on the space shuttle and brought into question if they could ever even fly to space. Going back two years before Challenger, the United States government implemented the Commercial Space Launch Act. With the goal to encourage, facilitate, and promote, Congress gave the Department of Transportation regulatory oversight on commercial space. This helped create a suitable environment for commercial vehicles to develop. Starting in the late 80s, entrepreneurs started taking interest in space, though none of these projects would take humans with them. It wouldn't be until 1996 when the first development in space tourism started, called the Ansari X Prize. Founded by Anushe Ansari, a future space tourist, the Ansari X Prize offered $10 million for the first team to build a vehicle that carried humans into space and was reused within two weeks. This prize spurred new interest in commercial spaceflight. The competition lasted eight years, with over 20 teams participating. In 2004, Scaled Composites vehicle called Spaceship One was the first to achieve these goals and won the competition. This vehicle would later turn into Virgin Galactic, a spaceflight company who has flown paying customers on suborbital flights. It is also important to mention that Blue Origin and SpaceX were founded around this time, with Blue Origin in 2000 and SpaceX in 2002. Two major players in suborbital tourism are Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin. In 2021, both companies were seemingly in a race to launch their first operational flights, with Virgin Galactic's flight beating out Blue Origin by nine days. This so-called billionaire's race to space narrative has been widely popularized, but for the sake of this video, I will be ignoring it. The first company we'll talk about is Virgin Galactic. As previously mentioned, the company was formed from the success of Scaled Composites Spaceship One. Four years after being founded, the company announced the creatively named Spaceship Two. The first power test flight of this vehicle was all the way in 2013, but after a fatal accident a year later, the vehicle was temporarily grounded and reviewed. As mentioned earlier, Blue Origin was founded in the year 2000, but didn't test their New Shepard tourism vehicle until 2015. What was the company doing for 15 years? No one really knows besides a few NASA contracts and the development of a rocket engine that is close to flying. Blue Origin tends to stay fairly secretive about developments until they have hardware ready to fly. There are lots of differences between Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic's launch systems, but here are a few key ones. Spaceship 2 is a two-stage spaceplane that can fly up to 82 kilometers above the Earth's surface. 
It can carry two pilots and six tourists and lands on a runway at Spaceport America, New Mexico. The entire flight lasts 90 minutes, but a majority of the time is spent inside Earth's atmosphere. New Shepard consists of a booster and a capsule that land separately, with the capsule being able to fly a little over 100 kilometers. It can carry six tourists and flies itself autonomously. It launches and lands in southern Texas, with each flight only lasting around 10 minutes. These two vehicles are currently the only options for flying tourists on suborbital flights. It's important now for me to explain the differences between orbital and suborbital trajectories. Suborbital rockets, like all vehicles previously mentioned, launch straight upwards, leave Earth's atmosphere for a few minutes, and then fall back down. Orbital vehicles launch upwards at first to get out of the atmosphere, but then use their engines to put energy sideways relative to Earth's surface. If the vehicle can go fast enough sideways, it's able to counteract the force of gravity and stay in space. This process of getting into orbit takes a substantially larger amount of energy than a suborbital flight. In the same year as Spaceship One's flight, Congress passed amendments to the 1984 Commercial Space Launch Act. This established a regulatory learning period on commercial human spaceflight. More importantly, it stated that NASA should seek the greatest possible commercial use of space. In 2006, NASA established the Commercial Orbital Transportation Program. This program offered contracts to commercial vehicles that could transport supplies to the International Space Station. This program was the first of many that has offered contracts to private companies for spaceflight services. These programs have greatly contributed to the rapid growth of commercial spaceflight, with a large amount of companies' capital coming from government investment. In SpaceX's first 10 years, 50% of its money was from NASA contracts. Even with the recent explosion in commercial space ventures, government money is still a major player in space. Going back to 2006, SpaceX submitted its proposal for the Commercial Orbital Transportation Program with a vehicle called Dragon. This program was going to be a replacement to the Space Shuttle, which was retired in 2011. The first iteration of Dragon isn't that important to our story as it only carried cargo to space, but its brother Crew Dragon is. In 2014, NASA selected Crew Dragon and Boeing Starliner for contracts to fly crew to the ISS. Dragon first carried astronauts to the ISS on May 30th, 2020. Since then, it has had six more crewed flights, with two of the missions being fully privately funded. Boeing Starliner had an uncrewed flight in late 2019, but due to technical setbacks, it is yet to fly people. These two vehicles are currently the only commercial spacecraft capable of carrying humans to orbit. The commercial spaceflight industry is still young and evolving. In less than 20 years, we've gone from no commercial vehicles to companies like SpaceX flying astronauts to the International Space Station regularly. This shift is promising for the future of space exploration in general, with commercial interest allowing for the increased development and implementation of new technologies not previously seen. This, along with the retirement of the space shuttle in 2011 and a nine-year gap in U.S. spaceflight capability, is making it clear that government space programs can't be the only way to space. <laughs>